The views and opinions expressed by the participants on this show are not necessarily those of Stewart Information Services Corporation, Stewart Title, or Stewart Insurance. Before you make any investment, you should seek the advice of your investment advisor or attorney. Whether you're a real estate broker, realtor, homeowner, buyer, or seller, everything matters when it comes to real estate. This is Real Estate Matters with Store Title. Store Title's Bill Napick and guests open the door to what really matters in owning, buying, and selling real estate. And now, Real Estate Matters with Store Title, brought to you by Stuart Insurance. Here to inform, entertain, and inspire, Bill Napick. Welcome to the show. It is Real Estate Matters with Stuart Title. I'm your host, Bill Napick, and we're going to get down to business right away. We have so many great things, tremendous guests. There's going to be content that you will not believe covering new ground. And once again, though, go to stuart.com forward slash radio to hear and see the YouTube video of this show or past shows. Let's get down to business right now as we have one of the commissioners of Trek, Texas Real Estate Commission, and she also has her own brokerage company. She is Leslie Lerner with Leslie Lerner Properties and the Trek Commissioner Leslie. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. Well, you have such important jobs, not just selling, helping buyers and sellers, but helping people, consumers and realtors via the Texas Real Estate Commission, also known as Trek. Let's tell people, first of all, about Trek. TREC is actually a regulatory agency and a licensing agency. We license brokers and agents, and we also are a consumer complaint agency. So we regulate the agents to make sure consumers aren't having issues with the agents they're dealing with, and we keep everybody on the straight and narrow. One of the things I think about, first of all, we're the first, fourth largest city. Some people say soon to be the third and just from a volume standpoint, plus the volume of transactions here, how, how many complaints are you getting? It, it would th- you would think that just from the, the sheer volume that you guys are busier than ever. Well, you would think, <laughs> but we don't get enough complaints actually to get a good pulse on what's going on. I think some agents are scared to give complaints. They're scared of retaliation. And then There's consumers that don't know they can give complaints or they're scared of retaliation or they don't want to take the time to do it. But we are a complaint-based agency, so we welcome complaints. That is how we know what's going on in the market and how we need to adjust and what we need to do with agents that aren't doing it correctly. Because the important thing is is that the process is improved along the way, right? Absolutely. In fact, you have a mission statement, I believe. Let's tell people what that is as far as, in fact, on your email, you talk about how passionate you are as far as improving the real estate world as far as the the transactions. Absolutely. Where my goal is, is I want the real estate agent to always remain valuable to the consumer. Otherwise, technology is going to take us over. And so unless agents are competent and honest and truthful, then we're not going to be valuable. So we're hoping that we, as an agency, can keep people honest and following the rules that the agency and the legislature have set out for us to follow. What was interesting, just yesterday you sent me some videos of the process as far as the trek meetings Correct. those were fascinating and are they for the general public where they could see them on youtube so trek does stream all of their meetings they're on the trek website and not only that people can come and make general comments at the meetings they can sign up to make comments or they can attend the meeting in person so everybody's welcome well, after seeing that, and that's the first time I saw it, I would encourage anyone in the real estate profession or someone curious about it, buyers and sellers or homeowners in general, it's fascinating to see how much each one of the commissioners, people on the panel, I don't know if that's the right word for it, but how much they care, how that comes through. And then the intricacies of when it is time to make a change all the considerations and what it i mean we have so that, many Leslie? working <laughs> groups and so many different groups that do such a great job to bring the commissioners just their work and to say hey this is what we found whether it's the education piece or the broker responsibility piece or the law piece the broker lawyer piece there's so many different groups that feed information to us to make this profession better So we do have a lot of people on different groups that actually 
or working groups that really give us good information to move forward. So it's just not the nine of us making decisions. And on the subject of the complaints again, now just I'll have to throw this in. Are you ever getting anyone that calls and says, hey, I just had a great experience or no. that's not what it's for? Okay, so we let's go back. We to- don't really get that. And, complaint, and that's not the purpose. No, really. and the complaint system is actually all in writing. It's actually going to be changed in the near future to being able to do it all online. Right now, there's forms online that are filled out, but hopefully in the next couple months or so, there'll be a new system and things will get inputted a little easier than they are at this point. What are the complaints that you hear the most? And you could start with either the ones from a consumer, buyer or seller, or realtors also can complain about the process or other bad behavior they see as far right. as agents, right? We see advertising complaints. We see people doing business without a license, which is not legal. We see competency issues on the up on the agency side there's just a multitude of different things we see so a lot of advertising or practicing without a license it seems like maybe now there's more people becoming real estate agents yes i drive up 99 on the west side of town and i see Cham- and champion school of real estate is a tremendous organization but when i drive on a weekday i always see it's packed so it makes me think that there's agents in there getting classes to keep their license or to learn and then there's also people that are want to become real estate agents right. so one of the things that you sent in your email is that some of the insurances that need to be brought forth maybe some extra things for people that are just brand new agents to make sure they're doing the right thing right i mean if many of us think back when we went to school or college we learned a great amount in books but applying that knowledge is something different exactly so i personally believe and this is my personal opinion is that agents need more training once they do get to a brokerage because they don't really have that hands-on knowledge it's an important, a gigantically important job to Absolutely. help someone buy and sell a home. Absolutely. A I mean, this is one of the biggest financial transactions a person may ever have. And so working with somebody that's knowledgeable is very important. No doubt about it. how many years have you been an agent and thus a broker, too? You became a broker. 30 years. 30? Almost 30 years. Wow. All right, let's transition a little bit. Before we leave the tr- subject of Trek and your mm-hmm. position there as a commissioner, what else should people know about that, about the Texas Real Estate Commission? And then we'll talk about your company. I mean, in general, the Texas Real Estate Commission is here to help consumers. Many times a consumer doesn't know the difference between a good and bad agent. So consumers really need to interview their agents, ask if this whatever they're doing is acceptable or not acceptable. Commission's not the only thing that anybody should ever really be concerned about. It depends if that agent is full service and is actually going to hold their client's hand throughout the process. As far as the passion that you bring forth to the position, also the people that you're, that were your associates there also seem to really care, as do some of the people participating with the questions mm-hmm. and things like that. Always ask questions. And even if you're an agent that's just getting licensed, Go interview your broker or the potential broker. See what they're going to offer you. Make sure your broker is going to give you a lot of training because otherwise you can't be successful in this business. And let's tell people the website for Trek because there's all it's very informative. I think I if I have it right, it's T-R-E-C, trek.texas.gov, right? There you go. Lots of frequently answered questions are on there and so much more. And of course, you are a broker with your own company. Let's tell people about Leslie Lerner Properties. Leslie Lerner Properties was formed when I noticed that technology was a little bit changing how we do business. And so I have a flat fee and rebated commission type of business. That doesn't mean that any service is taken away. It's completely full service. It's just for a little bit less of a fee. So depending on how much the house is you're selling is the way I stagger my flat fee. And then if you're buying a house, I rebate commission depending on how many houses I show you. So let's take the seller, for example. You're going to sell my house, for example. And I say, hey, Leslie, you'll do a market analysis. So we'll come up, you'll come up with, advise me of a number and say, hey, do we want to do that number, right? Yep. And then what other things are you doing with this flat fee? I mean, that sounds tremendous. I am doing everything. And if you look at the testimonials on my site, my clients can tell you, I pretty much hold your hand through the whole process. So we will do the market analysis. We will figure out a price for your house. We'll work together to figure out where you're comfortable. 
We put a sign in the yard. We take f- professional photos. We use a super lockbox. We do all of the showings and appoint- the appointment setting. We negotiate your contract. We negotiate repairs. If there's appraisal issues, we help try to help resolve those. And then we get you all the way to closing. And we are at the closing table with you. In addition, with that 30 years of experience, oh, yes. that experience is so yes. important. It is. It is important. And it's really important to have a trusted advisor next to you when you're sell, buying or selling your house. And let's look at the buyers. The buyer comes to you and they have a, a rebated situation. So let's say I want to look at homes. How do we start there? So when I first got into the business, looking for a home was literally looking on MLS that had a description and an address. It didn't have all the Map photos. It didn't, have, those, those it didn't have everything. <laughs> we even had a long key to get in the house into the lockbox. And times have changed and people shop online. Yeah. And since people can't shop online, they don't go to as many open houses and they don't go to as many showings or need as many showings. So I came up with a situation. If I show you one to three houses, I rebate 1% or one and a half percent. I'm sorry. And then four to six That's houses. That's a lot. It is a lot. And then Depending four to on six the price houses, of the house. I rebate 1%. And then after six houses, I don't hey. rebate. But most people can find a house these days within six houses, except in our current market where there's multiple offers on every house. It's another story. Yes, it is another story, but it seems to be cooling at, a, at this moment. On that note, no one knows, no one has a crystal ball or knows exactly. for sure. But here we are, mid, mid-year. How do you see things play out in the marketplace? Well, as we see What's these- as we see the interest rates going up, I think some people are getting cold feet. I know I've had some really good buyers in the last couple of weeks, two buyers that said, um, we're going to wait and see what happens. The stock market's going down. Oh. Interest rates are going up. This is just too much for us. We can't think about a house right now. It so is. people are putting home searches on hold. And right now in Houston, we have a lack of inventory. So that doesn't help when people aren't putting their house on the market either. It's like that great novel. We want to know what happens next in the exactly. next chapter. And and maybe that's one of the reasons why people listen to this show, because it's always current. As for a trek, I would like people to know file complaints. Make sure your agent is doing what they're supposed to be doing for you. And as if you want a flat fee or rebate a commission type of situation, please feel free to call me. It's all full service, but at a flat fee and a rebated commission. And they can reach you by... LeslieLearnerProperties.com or 713-489-9900. 713-489-9900. And the Trek website, I encourage you to go there, Trek, T-R-E-C dot Texas dot gov. Leslie Lerner, thanks for being on the show again. Thank you. Let's talk to a custom home builder. He is Gary Smith with Accenture Building Partners right here in Houston, Texas. Gary, welcome to the show. Thank you. Well, Gary, let's tell people you're in the custom home building. Yes. Let's, how did you even become a custom home builder? I've been in construction since the late 90s. And honestly, it's just been kind of a um, just a transition. I did a lot of remodeling for years and I worked in the apartment industry uh, as a project manager and I worked for other investors in the late 90s and into the 2000s and and it's really just kind of transitioned throughout the years as, as my company's grown. I would think and correct me if I'm wrong one of the parts of the satisfaction of your job is seeing what was once a flat piece of dirt right and then at the end of the, of the, the job you have a home there that people are going to live in make memories I mean, what's that feel like? Right. Well, I mean, to be honest, a, a lot of the reason that I do what I do is because I, I love it. I love having, whether it be a remodel, an addition, or new construction, I love the satisfaction of working with a customer, getting them exactly what it is that they want, knowing that that's something that's going to stand there for decade after decade after decade. And it's something that's exactly, you know, what works for that family. Yeah. And I would think also as a custom home builder through the process, there's a lot more input and connection with the people that you're building the home for. Yeah, exactly. You know, when you go in, it's you need to understand what their lifestyle is, you know, uh, how they utilize their house, their family size, things like that are, you know, all a small part of what goes into just the early process of helping them design their home. As far as the the distinctions of your company, the differences of Accenture building partners, let's tell people how you differ with the other people out here in the in the area. 
Well, I mean, in, in general, there's a really, honestly, when it comes to home building or any type of construction, there's only two ways, either it's right or it's wrong. So I hope that all other construction companies would do, you know, things the right way. With, with us, we're not a huge company, so we have the ability to give, I think, a little bit more um, personalized attention when it comes to working with our clients. And you're not just a number. You know, we only take on a certain number of projects. So I'll, I, I'll never build more than four to six custom homes at a time just because I want us to be able to have the opportunity to really walk hand in hand through the process with our clients. And since we've been through this pandemic, we've had shortages, lumber. How does that, how have you seen things change from then till now? How's that evolving? Is it get, getting any better, hopefully? Well, lumber prices are dropping. I think what's happened, if you look over historically and you look over what's happened since the pandemic, is it's really taking, it's really a learning curve. Everything from the suppliers to the manufacturers to us as home builders and the clients, the end user, is there is this adjustment period of expectation and reality where there are things that our suppliers can't control, we can't control, manufacturers can't control because you have this pent up demand that still is being affected today. Everything from lumber, you know, brick, windows, everything is, you know, appliances, for example, are things that need to be purchased now. Basically, almost sometimes when you pour your slab, you have to pay for your appliances because they're taking six, seven, eight months, nine months in some instances just to come in. So there's some new things that you're doing now than you did, didn't Absolutely. have to do five, yeah. you seven, can't, you seven can't years wait ago. To, yeah, you can't you wait ready. until you need something in two to three weeks. There are things that you have to pay for far further in the process. So the people that are reaching out to your company, Accenture Building Partners, when they reach out to you, is it after they buy a, a, a lot somewhere here in the Houston area and they say, okay, Gary, I'm going to give you a call. Tell me about building a home. How does that work? Or, or do you help them find the lot as well? Well, it's a combination of the two. I have a realtor that I work with uh, on a regular basis because I'm also an investor. And in some instances, I do work with the homeowners during their, uh, their search and they'll ask advice on the area because a lot of homeowners also are looking at it as an investment. You know, they, they don't want to build too well for the area that they're, that they're living in and may never, you know, recoup their, uh, their investment. And then you also do have the ones that already own their land and are wanting to, uh, to build their dream home on the land that they already own. So it's a combination of the two. Well, we also hear about so many people moving into Houston. Mm -hmm. In the world of custom builders, are you helping those people, too, that are coming from outside of the Houston area? If so, how are they finding out about you? Well, of course, we do have a, a website, but the majority of my, uh, my business comes from word of mouth. It's, it's typically people that I've done work for in the past or lenders that I've worked with that in, in a lot of instances have people that come in that are looking for a builder and they will send them over to me to see if, we're, if we are a, uh, a good match. At this point, I've only worked with a few people that are moving into the, uh, the city and either looking at teardowns. A lot of those instances are people that are buying houses and are wanting to, to, to demo them completely or add on to them and completely gut and remodel. Uh, and one or two that just bought raw land and uh, decided that they want to, you know, go ahead and build from the ground up. I say you're in the Houston area. Are you doing, do you do anything, say, in the woodlands, or is it all just right here in the Houston area, or, or what's your geographic? Right. I, I would say the greater Houston area, you know, about 45 minutes to an hour out from, you know, Central Business District. So right now I'm building in uh, down, way down 288 in Rose Sharon, uh, Richmond, um, 9959 area um, near University of Houston. I've done some in Spring Woodlands area uh, near Old Town Spring as well. One thing that's really important to me with our clients is transparency because the more information that they have, the better decision that they can make. And honestly, throughout the process, it makes it easier. You know, when, when your client understands a lot more about the process, then it kind of eliminates a lot of questions and, and, uh, and misgivings about what to expect. Well, I'm in admiration, someone that could build a home, because when we think about the home, it has so many components, a foundation, roofing, ventilation, AC, heaters, building specs, permits. How do you keep 
together and the balance to be able to handle these the massive amount of details into building something that's tangible meeting all the co- codes meeting the expectations and the design arc how do you do that? that's that's massive in my mind i mean it, it's having done it for a long time i can tell you it's one of the most important things is the early on design design stage and when you're working with a good architect engineer and in some instances a designer that's where the hard work is done you know, once that's done, building a house honestly is really paint by number, or you know, it's really almost paint by numbers. You know, it's important Step that everything one, is two. done exactly. You know, now there are things that have to be. There always seems to be a disconnect between engineering, architectural, and real world. So there's, you know, we're always calling audibles essentially, and in, in the, you know, uh, on the job site, it happens. Uh, and some of it is, you know, supply chain issues where you to keep the project moving, you have to make adjustments. But in general, it's there are a certain amount of components that go into a job and things have to be done in a certain order. And I mean, that honestly is just it. It's just the integrity of making sure that everything is being done properly. As far as the trends that you're seeing, what trends are you seeing? What are people looking for or what are you suggesting? Honestly, it's been all over the place. I have had people, the home I'm building in Rocheron right now, I would say it's contemporary. Uh, It's not super contemporary and modern, but it's, it's a warm contemporary, everything from just a regular traditional house, really all over the place. I haven't seen any ultra modern houses or, or clients interested in that, save maybe one or two. But the trends have been all over the place. You have your, um, you know, your, your kind of cycles of colors, you know, white oak versus, you know, your dark woods and things like that. You, you see that coming and going. But for the most part, it's the clients that I'm seeing, it really just depends on what speaks to them. And then garages, how many car garage? It, it, like this property, just out of curiosity, in Dro- Rose Sharon, how much land is that one on? A little over an acre. There you go. That's yeah. nice. That's going to be that. That's going to be a nice home. How long until that one's finished? Uh, we should be done in uh, late October. So about an eight month uh, build, actual construction time. So someone's going to have a brand new house on an acre right there in beautiful Rocher in Texas. Right. And they're building a lot out there. A lot of production builders are coming out there in uh, those uh, those neighborhoods. Um, so and then, you know, that's that's actually a whole other aspect in terms of expectations from clients is that they see production builders throw houses up, you know, for right, six right. months. And they don't understand there's a, there's a void between a production home and a custom home, you know, a typical custom home client will make, I think last time I looked at my personal numbers, we're having anywhere from like 12 to something like 12 to 14, at least what we would consider change orders. Um, as, they, as they change their mind along the way, oh, can we make process. this a little bigger exactly. out at the wall over here? Right, right. So that happens. Yeah. And that changes timelines. You know. Well, in terms of the building process, it's I think it's it's information whether it's whether it's us or any other uh, um, home builder. Just get as much information and clarity as possible, and understand that we all live in a uh, kind of a weird market and environment right now, uh, where there are a lot of uncertainties. Uh, however, you know you can never go wrong with real estate and building a home. Just get with someone that you know that is going to be upfront and honest and transparent with you. And as you look for forward to the rest of the year in terms of calculating and planning and strategy, how do you see the market play out? I've seen this before. Uh, when I built some houses in 2000. I think this was 15, 16, and oil and gas started to take a nosedive, and the market really cooled off rapidly. I my personal feeling is I don't see that. I don't think that we're going to go into a necessarily what I would call a recession in real estate prices. I think it's probably going to plateau. But again, we only have a you know finite number of uh, amount of inventory, so there still is going to be that demand. But I think that people are just going to be a little bit more cautious in where they spend their money. And Gary, let's tell people how they can reach you and your company. Uh, you can call us at eight three two. Two six four zero seven seven three, or go to our website. It's a centurebuildingpartners.com. That's A C C E N T U R E buildingpartners.com. Eight three two two six four zero seven seven three. Thank you so much, Gary Smith. Thank you. 
Let's talk history. We have Mr. McKinney right here with Mr. McKinney's Historic Houston. Mr. McKinney, welcome to the show. Oh my goodness, it's always an honor to be on the show and an honor to be on KPRC 950 AM because it's the oldest commercial radio station in our market in Houston, Texas, which is an honor. And let's tell people, what do the initials KPRC stand for? Well, they stand for Cotton Port Rail Center. How about that? Cotton Port Rail Center. And established in? In 1925, actually. Isn't goes that on amazing? The yeah, absolutely. And then and the second oldest in our market is actually KTRH. We're almost at 100 years. So, yeah, absolutely. Coming up. So, we should celebrate. And and this new, the new digs here, my first time, That's not right. from y'all's first time being here, obviously, but my first time being in this beautiful brand new in studio, nice, looking yeah. over the beautiful Loop 610 and Ari Bob Smith's original backyard. All this Who is Ari Bob Smith? You know, and I say backyard, but it was actually his land that he owned for uh, cattle purposes and for ranching. So Ari Bob Smith is an important character in Houston's real estate development area. He not just had lumber interests and cattle interests, and then later oil interests. He also, um, you know, had development because he's the reason why Loop 610 goes right through this area. Uh, literally, I mean, this is the magic circle. This is the part of Houston that uh, that he owned property on both sides of Loop 610. So if you if you wonder why the Loop um, veers to the west and then veers to the east, east after you go north of um, Westheimer Road, specifically Richmond, it's because the, he wanted prop, he wanted frontage road on both sides. And that's a very unique thing here in Houston and Texas specifically. You know, we love our feeder roads here in Texas, right? I, I've traveled all throughout the country and studied other major cities as well, and they don't have the kind of um, auto-centric city that we have. So, you know, and that plays a port, portion in real estate, it plays a portion in the overall growth and development of our city from a residential standpoint, which, of course, the residential happens, the commercial follows and vice versa. And people already have a sense that you know a little bit about Houston history, but let's tell them what you're doing day in and day out, because you have a really you know, unique niche right here in, in, oh in the Oh my goodness, city. yeah, it's non so First off, I want to invite everybody listening out there to like and follow Mr. McKinney's Historic Houston and the Houston History Bus on social media. Mr. McKinney, Mr. Spell out like Mr. Rogers, M-I-S-T-E-R, M-C-K-I-N-N-E-Y, Mr. McKinney's Historic Houston and the Houston History Bus, because what we mostly do is we teach Houston history and we actually teach it to realtors. And we do it in a fun way on board Houston's only open air school bus. So this device that I have, it's my mobile classroom. It holds 20 people. And we cover in detail every single neighborhood in Houston. So we're literally driving out. There's 284 subdivisions and you know, 22 historical districts. So we cover them in detail on board the bus. And I've also the pleasure of being the president for the downtown public library, the Julie Ideson building. We have 4.5 million photos in our collection. Why does that matter? Because as us as developers know and real estate folks know, Houston keeps re- Reinventing itself keeps changing. Houston has had nonstop growth since 1836 when Houston was founded. So we're always changing. Every 20, 15 years, uh, they're, they're doing it right now. We look just south of here in these beautiful studios, just south of here over in the River Oaks District, right? Well, back in the 1970s, that was a hot, you know, West Creek Apartments right there, right? And now it's redeveloped to become River Oaks District. So just wait 20, 15 years, the city will reinvent itself and change from a development standpoint. So my job is never done. And my market is not tourists. It's not visitors. It's folks listening to this show. It is native Houstonians, longtime Houstonians, folks that are passionate about real estate development, just like I am, whether it's industrial, commercial, residential, that's what we focus on. And I mentioned the library a second ago because we show old black and white photos on the bus. We're driving around Houston and showing you what used to be on that parking lot. Why? Because Houston changes so quickly, right? So to be able to see a parking lot in downtown Houston and know there used to be a building there, and then before that, there used to be a residential, a Victorian mansion, and before that, there was a ranch. So Houston, like I said, continues to reinvent itself. And that's not a bad thing. You know, no zoning here and uh, allows the market to dictate things and develop. And like you were inferring early on that where this building is here, KPRC, iHeartRadio on the 610 loop, that this was kind of the country at one time. Absolutely. Oh my gosh. We, we look at these continuous loops that we keep having, right? So there's I mean, pictures at this library of where we're at or this area. Pasture. Just nothing but well, well t t timber mostly, and then pasture a little bit further south of us. Timber because of the proximity of the bayou. So this is there's there's been lots of vegetation and greenery here. If you look at those old black and white photos, and I do that on many occasions. We look at these really cool aerial photos. For example, at the library, our earliest collection of aerial photos is actually 1925. It's the Brown collection of aerial photos. So you have a really strong detailed map of aerial shots of Houston back in 1925, and these are free of charge to the public. So if you're listening out there, I always tell people that have their own restaurant or bar, maybe their own real estate office. If you want to decorate your walls, you can buy that decorative art out there, but go to our library and research these images, or you can contact me. I'll be happy to help you. And let's put some old black and white photos of Houston's growth in your real estate business, right, or in your restaurant or in your bar, because then we can teach a message about how great Houston used to be and how it's changed in 20 years, 30 years, 40 years. 
It's amazing the growth, and it makes you, as we think about history, it makes you think about. 30 years from now, yeah. 100 years from now, these will be the old photographs. But let's tell people, I think you said on another uh, previous show that you can access those pictures free of charge. How do they do that? It's a website? Yeah, there's, there's, a, there's a really, it's the Houston Public Library's website. You can research it there. It's called the Houston uh, the Houston Metropolitan Research Center, the HMRC. But I created a bit.ly link, a really short link that my students showed me all about. It's www.bit.ly backslash capital H, capital R, capital HMRC rather, 76, the year that we opened the HMRC. And that's the link. So www.bit.ly backslash capital H, capital M, capital R, capital C, 76, gets you to the photo library, 4.5 million photos. Why I like being on the board and being the president is that we actually have another 5 million photos that are not even archived yet. So that means the public has no chance to look at these photos. And I'll give you an example. We just acquired the K. Marvin's collection. And K. Marvin's, his, his uh, uh, photo space was right there off of Montrose Boulevard, just south of Richmond, in the old, not too far from the old Ross Moen, uh, Ross Moen um, uh, residential development by Governor Ross Sterling in the 19- 1920s, right? Um, so you have this um, collection of historical portrait photos. So you can see what a lot of these Houston business who's who looks like. We look at our reels out there with their headshots, right? You can see these folks are. So that collection is important. And also the, the brand new Harold Israel collection has also been added to the HMRC. Who was Harold Israel? He was one of the photographers that followed around Roy Hoffines, Judge Roy Hoffines, and took photos of his early projects like the Astrodome and Astroworld and the Astrodomain Hotel. So Harold Israel's Gulf Publishing photos that we now have in our collection are about to be scanned in and available to the public eventually give you a really early idea of what these projects were like as they were growing and developing so it's kind of cool as you educate people on the houston history bus i've been on one of your tours the uptown tour that was incredible as as we drove through on the bus super awesome you do that all year long and we do have some interesting places in houston you mentioned river oaks the heights uptown the gallery all those things but the other thing you do, you're doing this year round, right? Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. But in addition, when certain holidays come out uh, or events, Halloween, you have a special tour with the bus uh, in the Heights. Yeah, Mr. The, McKinney's Haunted Houston. So we, we right. do a lot of different things, and, and then it's, the Christmas lights. Oh my goodness, yeah, the Christmas. So I, for those folks in the know, we get this every single year. Christmas in July is going to be happening in a couple of weeks. We're going to open up sales for the Christmas light tours. Why does this matter? Because we fill up fast. I kid you not. We go out every single evening from uh, November 27th, which will be Thanksgiving evening, all the way until January 1st, which is that Sunday after New Year's, and it fills up fast. It's so the demand is so strong. We've got to go out, Bill, at 5.30, 6.30, 7.30, 8.30, 9.30, and 10.30, and even an 11.30 tour. That's seven one-hour tours for me and my bus driver. No restroom break for us. Non-stop because the demand is so strong. People want to rent the bus out with their friends and their family and their clients and check out Christmas lights. And you get the history behind the mansions, who built the mansions, and where their money comes from. And that's what makes the tour so special. If you just want to see lights, go out there and you can get your own car and drive around. That's obviously free of charge. What we do as a nonprofit, we raise funds for our our, our projects that we do for school kids on board the bus. So we do appreciate people renting the bus out privately. And you can contact us, mrmckinney.com. Or you can always text or call me, 713-364-8674. That's 713-364-8674. And we'll talk about the prices and things that we offer because we work with everyone's budget. But it's a lot of fun because you learn about the history behind the mansions and people like that. And the neighborhood, River Oaks, 1924 to present day. We talk about everything. We even go back to 1923 and talk about the original country club that used to be there. Uh, well, it's still there now, but the, 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 the folks that actually developed the country club, which is a separate group that developed the neighborhood, two different organiz- two different groups that came together. So lots of history all around us. And interesting homes all around the city. But River Oaks, let's talk about that. Pick maybe two of the most interesting or the ones that come to mind Absolutely. as far as two River Oaks homes that you could tell us a little bit about their history. So, yeah, we do a separate River Oaks tour in the daytime. It's called Mary Mansions with Mr. McKinney over at the hotel, at the Houstonian Hotel Club and Spa. And we did that for a while. And we still offer that tour on board the bus. And it's a history of John Staub. And John Staub was really a resident architect of the River Oaks Corporation back in 1924 on. He did the 1923 River Oaks Country Club, the original country club. John Staub's actual houses in River Oaks right there uh, off of uh, Del Monte and Larchmont, uh, which is still there, was built in 26. So there's just history all around us. So we do talk about those houses in detail on board the bus. And it's just fun and different and unique. And like I said, you can you can do your own thing. But with us, you get you get both of the best of worlds. So it really works out well. You're also helping educating children around the city. Tell us about your work there with the kids. Absolutely. And bring, I mean, Houston, I mean, we're 
privilege to have you as a historian, I would think as I'm a child, a teen or yeah. whatever, and even as an adult. I mean, this is fascinating to know what's going on in your city. Well, I'll tell you why I do that. Well, we have 23 historical districts and neighborhoods here in Houston, and it's so important. Uh, some of us know recently the, the Riverside Terrace District that did not pass. Uh, there's hopes to make a Tanglewood district as well, which Tanglewood deserves credit. I mean, 1949, William Farrington, a really important developer who shaped our city. He was a banker. He also did uh, the Southdale portion of Bel Air back in the 1930s. If we look at the city of Bel Air and how it shaped as well, Bel Air goes back to 1908 as a farm community and then evolves during the post-World War II boom. But that whole Southdale portion of Bel Air, and this is what I love about real estate history as well and the history that we teach is that realtors need to listen up because I love when they love to say they're the experts in a neighborhood and no one knows everything about Houston history, including myself. Nobody does because no, none of us were here 186 years ago when Houston was founded, right? We're all learning from each other. So I'm constantly learning from old time residents of different neighborhoods. But, you know, you really should know a little bit about the history and that's going to separate you from other people. And I, and I do want to talk about towards the end of the show, just a little bit about this, this kind of, it's not new, but it's something fun that we're doing now. We just did it over on Tuesday uh, with uh, with a realtor and a home that was for sale, uh, really partnering up with historical houses. But when it comes to kids and teaching kids about Houston history, I'm passionate because I want these young people to grow up and maybe to consider living in an historical house, right? Here they are deciding that maybe the neighborhood of the Houston Heights is important for them because they love history. They were impacted by something we did on board the bus. And we do a lot with kids in the Heights, and mostly because of history is all around them. Harvard Elementary School, for example, 1892, has been around for a long time, and their history is all around us. So we take those kids out mostly. Uh, Principal Alanis is so wonderful to get her, her, not only her staff, but also the kids on board the bus. And there's just so much history all around there still intact that we can drive around and have a really good conversation as the kids are learning about history. And the open air bus format's important. Uh, we do go out in the summer months. We just go out uh, in the evening when the weather's not too hot, uh, or you can always book it in advance. We do get filled up pretty fastly. We're not a tour company, so we you have to have 20 people. You've got to rent the bus out privately. It's a private experience with you and your friends. That's, how, that's actually what you want anyway. You don't want folks you might not know on board the bus. You want it to be kind of a private experience, something VIP, and we'll go in a neighborhood in Houston. If you're a realtor out there and you've got an historical property, you know, do what Terry Gary did over with Amy Bernstein Realty recently. Do what Star Massing did over at Boulevard Realty. We've done some really cool videos on YouTube where Mr. McKinney, Houston historian, comes into your historical property. I talk about the history behind the neighborhood. You talk about the home, and it's a really fun mashup that we do. I've had class at cars in these videos also. I've had Barrier War with Trees for Houston talk about some really historical trees that have been in some neighborhoods behind the houses and around the houses. So just go to YouTube and look up Mr. McKinney's Historic Houston. That's all I focus on is Houston history. And if you're a realtor trying to sell a historical property, I'd be honored to partner up with you. It doesn't cost you anything. We do these to promote history. And how can people reach you, Mr. McKinney? Always at mrmckinney.com, spelled out like Mr. Rogers, M-I-S-T-E-R-M-C-K-I-N-N-E-Y at gmail.com or mrmckinney.com or always text or call 713-364-8674. That's 713-364-8674. It's never a bother. We'd love to chat about history. One more time, but real slow. The phone number. Okay, real slow. It is simple. You can just text or call 713-364-8674. We'd love to have you at 713-364-8674. Thank you, Mr. McKinney. My pleasure. Real Estate Matters with Stuart Title would not be possible without our partner, Stuart Insurance, with a focus in real estate and a special focus on real estate brokers. Stuart Insurance creates insurance plans to address the risks facing our industry today. They invest a significant amount of time helping real estate broker owners offset and manage their risks. Here he is, John Bramlett with Stuart Insurance. Hey, John. Hi, Bill. Always a pleasure to be with you. It's always exciting. So here we are covering a lot of bases here today. I'm I'm very excited about the content that we're bringing out there today. It's always interesting, right? Absolutely. I mean, learning about the regulations and the ability to, if we have a situation with a realtor or broker that we're not comfortable with, or if a realtor or broker has a situation they're not comfortable with, that there's a resource through the state of Texas and TREC and, you know, uh, what we learned there. And then, you know, understanding a bit more about how to build a custom home. And then if you've got a group that wants to really learn about the great real estate or just history of Houston in general, we've got a, a resource there. And there's no question, this city is just amazing. The people that are here, the way it's evolved, and just the, the nuances that I think in many cases are unique just around the world, in fact. Well, it is a great city. There's no question about that. Everyone here in this city, almost has insurance or wants to know about insurance. And that's why this segment is so popular. Well, it is. And, you know, we mentioned uh, several weeks ago that, you know, now we're uh, wrapping up the month of June. We're, you know, officially a full month into hurricane season. 
Where's the rain, by the way? You know, <laughs> We don't have it right now, that's for sure, in Houston. <laughs> but there are a couple of things to keep it that I wanted to talk about as it relates to the flood coverage. One is you don't have to be on a coastal area, you don't have to live in the coastal plain to be affected by flood. If you'll just look at what's happened this month in the news at Yellowstone. Yeah. Now it's National Park. I mean, they shut the entire park down because of flooding issues. So if you lived in and around Yellowstone National Park, there's a good chance you were flooded. You know, if you live in an area where you could be affected by melting snow or uh, if there was a, a fire and you're affected by a mudslide, you know, unusual rain, which we don't have, or if a dam fails or a levee fails or you have um, city pipes that burst and would flood your home. So it's more than just a hurricane. So that's the one thing to keep in mind that, you know, if I don't live on the coast, maybe I should just avoid having flood coverage that's not necessarily the case the second thing that i wanted to talk a bit about today was the difference between the flood coverage that you can receive from nfip the national flood insurance program which is backed by the federal government or that you could get from a private or just an insurance company that they would sell privately that's right we heard a few years ago i know when my home went through a flood with hurricane harvey down the road about six months from there, I heard about private flood insurance, and uh, I guess that's a thing now. It is. So historically, the majority of home plans uh, came through the National Flood Insurance Program, NFIP. Uh, and sometimes they were bought directly from the federal government through NFIP, or they would be written on the same paper, but you could go to an insurance company or broker and buy it that way. So we've sold uh, insurance plans for our clients through NFIP. And then there are insurance partners that we have that we can sell it direct or we can write, but it's the same plan on the same paper. However, there are some insurance companies that have decided that they wanted to get in that business. They felt like that they could be more competitive and provide at least an alternative for uh, families to consider when they're buying home insurance. There are several companies that, that do that. And it really kind of comes down to what your needs are. And there's some pluses and minuses to both. So with our time today, uh, I'd kind of like to talk about what those, those differences are between the two and at least gives our, our listeners a chance to be better informed so that when they're visiting with an insurance advisor, they can ask some specific questions to determine which, which process or program would make best sense for them. Well, let's talk about coverage at first. For the National Flood Insurance Program, uh, the base coverage for your property, your primary property, is $250,000. So that's the liability limit. With a private program, you can also do it at $250,000, or you can go higher, in many cases, uh, over a million. Uh, so you've got, if you've got a more expensive home, a builder home, the private program or the private uh, venue might be the best way to go. In some cases on the NFIP, they can offer what's called excess coverage but that can be at times difficult to get a hold of. You know, if 250000 is is enough for you and your, your home or you're comfortable with that and, and you could pick up the rest, then the NFIP might make sense. If you've got a home where you'd like to have coverage maybe greater than, you know, 500000 a million or greater, uh, the private might make sense. With the primary home on NFIP, the governmental process, the replacement cost is only available for your primary residence. So the replacement cost is, replaces the cost of the home at today's market value without any depreciation. If you have a secondary home or for your contents on the NFIP, it's actual cash value. So there's a depreciation taken into it. And you don't have that with with NFIP. Or you can you can negotiate that as a as additional uh, potential endorsement on that, that everything is replacement cost versus actual cash value. The private providers, you can tailor it more to what you need versus, hey, here's this is what we have. And quite frankly, even with the NFIP, it's, it's better to have that. Oh, I, know, it, I know firsthand well, it, it's, than have nothing. That's it's for better sure. to have nothing, but you're right. There is a, the ability to tailor. Right. Now, with that can come some potentially additional costs, but you can tailor. For example, your contents with the NFIP program, the liability limit is set at $100,000. So the material you have within your home uh, to replace that, you know, it's at actual cash value, $100,000. You can negotiate a greater level with the, the private funds. So you can also maybe increase coverage for jewelry or if you had collectibles. And the NFIP has a very set 
limit, you might be able to negotiate with a private company a bit more. As you said, tailor your coverage. The private insurance companies or flood coverage at times can also offer uh, living expenses. So if you're going to be out of your home for a period of time, NFIP coverage is not going to help you with the cost of, let's say, renting an apartment while your home is being rebuilt uh, by Gary. So now what you would do with the private coverage is they would help with some of that, those living expenses. So again, that's the ability to maybe tailor a bit more on the, um, on the private side. Um, both generally have a 30-day waiting period. If you're in the middle of buying a home, when you buy the home uh, at closing, if you do your transaction at that time, then your flood coverage becomes automatic that day of closing. If you decide to wait, in most cases, it's going to be 30 days for both policies. There are some private companies that indicate that they might be able to do it sooner than 30 days, but we always counsel our clients just to to wait. Just to be to, safe. To be yeah. safe, it's going to be 30 days. The other area to take a look at is the ability to be insured. As long as the federal government maintains the uh, National Flood Insurance Program, you're not going to be declined. They may not be able to cover you directly if you have had, let's say, um, two or more claims in a five-year period. But what they can do is send you then to FEMA, which is the Federal Emergency Management Agency, F-E-M-I-A, not F-I-M-A, F-E-M-A, and FEMA can then work with you on that. But, you know, you're not going to be a situation where they're going to say, let's say you're a brand new homeowner. You can go through NFIP and they're going to write your plan. It may be expensive depending upon the house and where you live, but they'll write the plan. On the pli- the private side, they're going to f- ask you to have an application also, but they may decline the application or they may decide within a year, we don't have an appetite for flood coverage anymore and they get out of it. Or they may decide after a year, we don't want to cover you anymore for whatever reason. So there are some risks on that end, on the private side, about you may or may not have coverage. And I guess the last thing that I wanted to mention would be the cost. So what's the premium like? If you were looking at apples to apples, so $250,000 liability limit for the main structure, didn't have any other properties, and you were looking at $100,000 for content, and a private company, you might be able to save some money on your premium. But again, every situation is unique and different, and that's why you need to work with your insurance advisor. Where the private uh, situation might come more expensive is if you begin that tailoring that you talked about earlier, that if you start adding, I want to be able to have uh, living expenses, or I want to be able to cover uh, buildings that aren't attached to my home, or I want to have... uh, I might have a barn on my property. Exactly. I want my liability limit for my primary residence to be a million dollars or I want my content coverage to be higher, then you may be paying a higher premium. But again, it's worth working with an insurance advisor so they can understand what your needs are. They can understand what your concerns are. And then based on that, they'll build a plan either through a private provider or NFIP that best best suits your needs. John, let's tell people how they can reach out to you to find out more about it with Stewart Insurance. Absolutely. If they'd like to learn more about Stewart Insurance, they can visit us at stewartinsurance.com. If you'd like to visit with one of our advisors about your flood plan or your home plan, auto, motorcycle, wind, if you're a real estate business and your errors and emissions, commercial liability, or excuse me, general liability, commercial property, we can help you. Uh, they can call us at 866-798-2827. That's 866 866- Seven nine eight two eight two seven, or they can email us at Stuart Insurance at Stuart dot com. I wonder if you all can get insurance for an open air school bus. I, I, I'm sure we can probably find a way to, to cover a an open provider, air yeah. an open air school bus. Exactly right now, I don't know if we can uh, provide coverage for Mr. McKinney's vocal cords. That's another uh, story. That'd yeah. be another story. Yes, yes. <laughs> Again, the phone number is eight six six seven nine eight two eight two seven. Thank you so much, John Bramlett. Always a pleasure, Bill. As we close the show, Leslie Lerner is back. She is a commissioner at the Texas Real Estate Commission and broker owner of Leslie Lerner Properties. Leslie, welcome back to the show. What else should we know? If you have anything that you think may not be on the up and up, or if you have questions for Trek, please don't hesitate to go on the website, trek.texas.gov, or call, and you will get to the right person to ask your questions or to file a complaint. You can file a complaint online. That is the only way we improve. Otherwise, if you have real estate questions, call Leslie Lerner Properties at 713-489-9900. That's right. You are also 
30 years of experience, commissioner, one of the commissioners on Trek. In addition, you're helping buyers and sellers every day in a tremendous way. I am, or I try to at least. Again, Leslie, let, let's tell people your, your phone number. 713-489-9900. 713-489-9900. Thank you so much, Thank you for Leslie having me. Lerner. And now he's back, Gary Smith, with Accenture Building Partners, a custom home builder right here in the Houston area. Gary, what else do you want people to know about the building process, your company, or anything else? You know, if anyone has any questions, they have more than uh more than welcome to give us a call give us an email uh work a lot with realtors that are looking for information uh, education about you know certain things for their clients either buying or selling their homes reach out to me all the time but in general it's just education about your uh, your home your remodel custom home whatever it is education about is the uh, the most important aspect of it and as you're helping people with the custom homes is there an average square footage size that you're selling these days or is it just all over the board well, I mean, for me as an investor, I typically keep to a formula. So if I'm building a house for sale, the market that I typically stay in, I typically will build somewhere around 2,200, 2,400 square feet. In terms of my clients, it's really all over the all over the place. I have a client that is right at just over 2,200 square feet, actually. And the largest right now is, I believe, somewhere around 6,100-ish square feet over right over here in Meyerland that we'll be starting in, I think, November. Yeah, I think if it were me, I'd get the 2,500 square feet and a six-car garage right, just to right. go in there and hang out. Right. I mean, I a lot of people are doing four-car. Uh, <laughs> oh. Yeah, I have a number of people doing four-car garages right now. You build a little workshop in right, there. Right, exactly. Uh, the one near U of H actually is a four-car garage, but the the back corner is the husband's. That's, that's his man cave. And let's tell people, Gary, how they can reach you at Accenture Building Partners. Again, you can always uh, text or call uh, 832-264-0773. Again, that's 832-264-0773. Or you can just go to our website, which is AccentureBuildingPartners.com. That's A-C-C. E-N-T-U-R-E, buildingpartners.com. Mr. McKinney, Sam Houston. I mean, we named the city. The city has been named after Sam Houston. He actually lived here. Let's tell people about that. Yeah. He and he had, didn't have a car or air conditioning. I don't know how he just that had worked. a horse. I'm telling you. No, horse. you know, you're right. He actually had two houses here in Houston. One of them was on Caroline Street, his personal residence. And then he also lived in the White House of Texas. Now, why did Houston have a White House in Texas in the corner of Maine and Preston? That's because that's also where Mary Bill Lamar slept, too. But he lived there because he was the president of the Republic of Texas. So Texas was a separate country from 1836 to 1845, which oh. we talk about on board the bus. You get a lot of great so Houston it was the White House. history. It was the White House for any president that was there. And Houston was the capital for the Republic of Texas back in 1830, 1837, 1838. It's also Houston's birthday coming up on August 30th. So August 30th, 1836. Realtors, if you're listening out there, think about that. Actually, the contract was signed on August 26th, 1836. That's my birthday, yeah. August 26th. But four days later, we celebrate Houston's birthday four days later. Anybody know why? Now, if we sign the paperwork and the title, 26th. we got yeah on the twenty sixth, four days later. Why we celebrate it? Because that's when Houston put a full page article in the newspaper saying that Houston lots are for sale. So Houston has always been tied to marketing and real estate since the very beginning. Okay, it's in our blood. It's in our blood since eighteen thirty six. August 30th, Houston will be how old? 186 years young, okay? And I'm cheering the city of Houston's birthday for Mayor Turner, and it's happening at the Heritage Society on August 27th. That's a Saturday, by the way, so come join us. Free uh, cake and free goodies and free tours of these historical houses that are at the Heritage Society, and, of course, free tours on board the Houston History Bus. So join us on August 27th, okay? 4 o'clock to 6 o'clock and downtown Houston, 1100 Bagby. And follow my social media sites, Mr. McKinney's Historic Houston and the Houston History Bus, because that's where you'll find out about all these great things that we do. Tell us again where the White House was for Texas. Preston and Maine. There's a and subway there, there now? There's a subway there now. A subway it's in the 19- sandwich shop? A subway sandwich <laughs> shop, okay? So it's in the 1909 <laughs> Scanlon right. Building. It's a beautiful building right there on the corner, and that's right at the corner of Preston. It's in the southeast oh, corner man. of, and there's a plaque on the building, by the way, the southeast corner of Maine and Preston in downtown Houston, 300, 400 block of Maine. Thank yeah. you all for listening to Real Estate Matters with Stuart Title. There you go, a super show. Check us out if you want to hear it again, stuart.com forward slash radio. That's stuart.com forward slash radio. I am your host, Bill Nampick, together with John Bramlett, Tom Carpentier, Larry Warren. Thanks for watching the show, stuart.com forward slash Houston. And thank you to all our great guests. We'll see you next week.